Welcome to Watch Cha's Tabletop World, a channel devoted to the love of board gaming. My name is Sweetness Watch Cha, and today we're looking at as many of the archetypes as I could think of and cram into this sh short segment for Lord of the Rings the card game. So the purpose of this video is to act as a jumping off point. And that what I'm hoping to help people with is to find and understand the archetypes, all the major archetypes of this game, and then be able to use that in order to um, guide their buying decisions or allow you to get excited about building certain kinds of decks. Or um, you can go on to Rings DV if you like an archetype that you see here and look up some of the cards and try to find some decks uh, that other players have built. There's thousands of decks available on Rings DB. Um, so if you don't want to do the deck building aspect, but you like something you see, that's an opportunity for you. Okay, so they're not in any particular order because there's so many and I wasn't quite sure how to organize them, but let's get started. I'll also rank these um, in terms of their power uh, in, a, in a very loose scale. I'll just say top tier, um, good or weaker deck style. So getting started right away, let's go with Hirgon. Hirgon, uh, like many decks, revolve around a specific hero. Um, this archetype usually goes and it has this hero lineup. Uh, you'll commit all your characters to the quest since they're all very high willpower. And then after the quest phase, you'll put in an, a reduced cost ally. Uh, this is a medium strength, uh, powerful deck. And uh, upsides, it's fun to play, but downsides, unfortunately, um, a lot of times in the planning phase, you don't have a whole lot to do. Uh, so, and, and some of the quests that wipe out your hero resources can be kind of problematic. Next up is a one ring deck. Uh, this one, you'll equip one of your characters with the one ring, which is a very powerful artifact, and you'll get to start in your hand with, uh, there's a bunch of these specific cards, or there's some other cards that have cancellation on them, uh, but it all revolves around raising your threat and exhausting the one ring to do some kind of powerful effect. The entire group will lose though, however, if the ring bearer dies, so there is a cost there. Um, this is a little bit polarizing in the community as, you know, they don't, it's, it tends to be quite powerful on um, the effects that you can do when you start with some of these things in your hand. Um, I would say it's a medium to, to, to very, very strong deck. Next up is a minor archetype, which is uh, songs. Songs are an important part of, in Lord of the Rings. Uh, in the books especially, they're full of songs. The song decks, um, there is some minor so song support. There aren't any really heroes tied to this archetype. A lot of times people will use Fireside Song on one of their Hobbit heroes and Love of Tales to generate resources when they play different uh, songs. And then they can include lots of different cards in their deck because they're not worried about resource matches. But it's more thematic than powerful. Next up is the Victory Display decks. These decks involve control, usually involve controlling the encounter deck, what it can put out by limiting the cards or organizing them in a way uh, that makes the encounter deck nerfed um, or just outright removing cards from the deck. Um, sometimes it can revolve around Raciel, although oftentimes they don't, but they do always involve uh, a full lineup of lore heroes. So you can play um, uh, the scroll of Isildur in order to recur a lot of your events, um, but you'll pick generally lower threaded heroes. This deck is can sometimes struggle in solo. Uh, in multiplayer, it does take a little while to get rolling, and if you're on a really, really hard quest, uh, it can, you know, you don't have enough time to get ready. However, uh, it can be very, very pow powerful as you're taking the teeth out of the, um, out of the encounter deck. So it's kind of, uh, it's either going to win big or you're going to lose big, I think, on this one. It's also kind of a smart little deck. You feel smart while you're playing it. It involves a lot of interesting decisions. It's more for a player that likes to play the game a little differently than other players. And you don't want to just, you know, smash down the enemies and stuff. You just want to be a clever player. Next up is the Three Hunters Contract. This is a very fun thematic contract that uh, has some limitations and some benefits. The Three Hunters allows you to uh, only, you can't play with any allies, you have to just play with heroes, but you get a bunch of benefits for doing so. Generally, you'll want to pick heroes that work together quite well, or that they have some kind of self-readying, so that you can get the most out of them, since you don't, you're not going to be able to put any allies on the board. And then you can use cards that, um, that are synergized with that strategy. This is a very fun deck to play, especially thematically. However, uh, you have to move very quickly and get your characters set up very quickly or you will lose. After you get set up, unfortunately, the game can t tend to be not as exciting because you already played all your cards and you don't have a whole lot to do. Um, so this deck is kind of, can be very powerful, very similar to Victory Point 1. You can lose quickly or you can win, win pretty big. Um, it is a very thematic deck to play and it's, I would say, medium, uh, medium strength. Next up are the Dwarves. Dwarves tend to fall into a couple of different archetypes, but the major archetype is with Dine Ironfoot. Now, Dine Ironfoot 
uh, is one of the early on heroes in the game, and he's a bit broken. He gives all your dwarves, uh, actually, excuse me, all dwarves in the in the game, uh, plus one fight and plus attack and plus one willpower. These decks can churn out tons and tons and tons of dwarves uh, using Legacy of Dur Durin, cards like Keeley, and then eventually putting out your Erebor Battlemasters, who are just bonkersly strong. Um, other heroes, there's a whole bunch of other heroes you can add in, which can lower your threat, draw you more cards. Um, one of the other things is if you have a lot of the cards tend to go on five dwarves, so having five dwarves in play gives you much better benefits. Um, the dwarves are like a swarm kind of a faction, I guess, if you want to use the term faction. You play a lot of cards, very, very strong. If you've got multiplayer and they're both playing them, they can be ridiculously good. Dwarves remain to this day top tier players. One of the other ways you see dwarves is with mining, the mining mechanism, which, which involves milling cards off of your deck and then reaping some other rewards. Uh, two of the major cards involved are like Erudun Miner, who if he gets discarded off the top of your deck, he enters play. Hidden Cache will uh, give you resources, which is very helpful. Um, Dying Ironfoot is a great hero to revolve around that, since you, you can use him to um, mill the cards. There are some cards in the deck, some uh, heroes and things that allow you to see the top card, and that can be a very powerful combination and a very fun one. Uh, there's another combo that you can use that involves mining that you don't even need dwarves to do. You can do this with any deck, which is uh, using the Stargazer and Zidjil Miner in order to set up the top bunch of your cards, guess a number, and then get a lot of resources from this card. So that's a very popular or older combo and when used all in conjunction together can be a very fun archetype and you can get things back from your graveyard etc um, mining is a medium weight depends it's a very loose thing you can put it into a lot of decks so it doesn't really uh you know really is deck dependent on its strength but it is one of the my favorite ways to play that dying iron book deck is a very fun one to play Next up, we have Blood of Numenor and the Gondorian Fire deck. And this deck is a, uh, uses a lot of different heroes and things, but essentially it revolves around using the Steward of Gondor to give the Gondor trait to your hero. And then you can put these cards on there, rack up a ton of resources, have other ways to generate resources, and then you're used to having maddeningly high attack and defense rates, so you can just wipe the board out. Um, this is done oftentimes, uh, one of the most powerful decks ever to have been conceived was with... Uh, a hero, the hero Boromir. He's since been errated, but essentially he could ready up for a threat. He's a very powerful hero. One of the deck types around him is to control the whole board. You give him the ability to cancel shadow cards, give him a Gondorian uh, a shield, and essentially every combat he blocks every enemy and kills every enemy. And that's uh, kind of been nerfed, but it is still a very it is could still be a very potent deck. Um, the Boromir deck with Blood and, and Fire was probably the strongest deck that you could play for a long while. Since the nerf, I still think it's a very strong uh, combo, you know, to keep him and, and juice, uh, juice Boromir up because he can still ready in different phases. So he could, if you wanted to, you could quest with him, you could do something in the, in the travel phase, etc., etc. And having a better understanding of the game and the phases and things, I think, allows a, a more seasoned player to get more out of that, board, the nerfed Boromir. Next up, we have the Dunedain. Very, very awesome faction. Um, a little less represented. People don't really know about them from the movies. They're, they're uh, definitely more uh, present in the books and the understanding of them is more present in the books. But their faction is all about keeping enemies engaged with you. So you'll have, there's lots of cards that, are, that get benefits uh, depending on how many enemies are engaged with you. There's uh, cards that are free or very inexpensive and yet, but bring an enemy out, but then that helps your strategy. And there's characters that gain extra resources, etc. Aragorn being the leader of the Dunedain has a has a hero in this archetype. It can be quite a heart, uh, very powerful archetype if used correctly. Um, however, there is a very big danger in using this archetype as all the shadow effects that the enemies have, you know, and you have to block all these enemies, it's very easy for something to go wrong. So this is another kind of deck that you can win really big and re win really well, or you can get com completely crushed. Um, it kind of depends on, on the scenario, I think. There is another little sub-archetype within the Dunedain, which is the Vigilant Dunedain Keep Watch combo, and that involves using uh, this character here and Keep Watch in the victory display and essentially letting him block everything on the board. They were very smart, though, and gave him traits that you can... Um, it's very hard to bump up his defense, and so that's the kind of trade-off there. So it is an interesting deck to play, although um, depending on the scenario, uh, there are some scenarios he's amazing, and there are other scenarios where he can get really crushed pretty easily, but it is interesting nonetheless. Next up is my absolute favorite faction, my favorite kind of deck to play. It's so much fun, and it, that is the Sylvans. Now, the elves in this game are divided really essentially into two camps. In Tolkien's world, there's tons and tons of different kinds of elves. Here in this 
game, there's Sylvan and there's Noldor. That's it. And sometimes, you know, uh, Tolkien snobs and people that are really into the lore might have a little problem with that. But for gameplay and mechanism wise, that's how they did it. Now, the Syl Sylvan deck is all about bouncing your Sylvans in and out. They come in and out of the trees and they all do an effect. And it's all about bringing in, you know, cheap allies and they get um, beefed up by uh, Celeborn here. So the round they get under play, they'll get buffed up stats. And so you'll play these inexpensive Sylvans, which have come into play attacks, uh, effects that'll grab out extra cards. And then you'll bring them back to your hand in order to bring out more powerful allies, reduce your um, threat, you know, cancel attacks, and you'll bring them back in again to, to heal and etc. There's tons and tons of cards for this archetype. There's also a little uh, splinter archetype that came out um, years later with Thranduil, where you can play uh, Sylvan in the combat phase, and, and you know, there, there's a bunch of interesting things there, or to bring them back to ready characters. So there's a very, there's a large amount in this faction. Um, it can be a very, very, very powerful faction. However, it does have a weakness. Um, all the Sylvans are like one hit point, so this, if you have a blanket kind of quest that does a damage to everybody, it can really wipe you out. And if you kind of stall out on your card draw um, and you can't keep that, that engine rolling of playing cards and pulling the elves back and playing them again, your engine can stall a little bit. But as so, I would say it's a medium strength, medium to high, but I again, I think it is without any without any peer here, it is my favorite and absolute best deck to play. You also feel quite smart. You make a lot of interesting decisions and you're very busy all the time. Um, other decks that are fun to play too, like the three hunters I mentioned before, you know, you can play, get your guys set up and then you don't have much to do for the game. But with this kind of a deck, you're playing, making all sorts of interesting choices the entire game. Next up, we have the direct damage uh, archetype. And there's, um, there's, some, there's not a ton of support, but there are cards that can, you know, deal damage to things. Um, whether you're defending them or, or pinging damage, there's events and things and different characters and things that can add damage to things. There's not a ton of support for this. It's not really an archetype that I can talk about the power and the strength of, um, but there is, a, there are, there are, you can make a couple of dedicated decks, different kinds of dedicated decks, although you'll end up using a lot of the same cards. There's not a ton of it, but it is there if you like the idea of like playing red and magic or something where you're kind of like, you know, dealing points of damage here and there. Next up, we have the Outlands. Now, the Outlands was another one that's very important in the books. Um, Dal Amroth and uh, Prince Imrahil, very, very important characters that they left out of the films. And this is a deck that came out um, early, fairly early on in the life of the game, and it was kind of met with some uh, mixed feelings from the community. Now, it's a very, very powerful archetype. At least it was at the time. Maybe it was the, the top tier deck at the time, other than dwarves. Um, now, I'm not quite sure it's as powerful as, as you know, as it once was. But it's sort of an autoplay deck. It's powerful in the decisions. There's not a lot of decisions there. It could be a good deck for a beginner, but let's take a look at what makes it, uh, what makes it tick. You've got usually it involves Hero and the Fair. Um, you use his resources, and you can play out all these Outlands allies. There's more, you know, there's others, but this is just an example of some. But you know, some boost your willpower. They'll boost all the Outlands. So if you had these four on the board, he would be charging up all of their willpower. He would be charging up all their attack, and you can see all of the each of your allies is getting more and more and more powerful. So uh, giving more hit points, etc. So it's a bit of an autoplay type of uh, uh, a faction. Not that exciting, but the Outlands allies on themselves uh, are still very powerful and they're easily splashed through different decks. Sometimes players playing a very, very difficult quest in the early days might get frustrated playing a few different decks and then they say, screw this, I'm getting my Outlands deck and I'm going to roll over this, you know, because you get a little frustrated. Next up, we have another one of these sub archetypes, and this is pipes. Now, pipes are a very important part of Lord of the Rings. There's um, not a ton of cards um, surrounding this, uh, and they're more thematic than anything else. So, usually, cards that won't make it into a major deck, or if they do, it's singles, and they're not really working on the whole synergy of pipes. However, there is a very powerful card, Smoke and Think, which allows you to play some very powerful cards if you have lots of pipes in play. Um, and pipes generally are very good. Uh, depending on the archetype they're in, but as a whole, it's much more of a thematic deck like Songs than it is uh, has any real, you know, major power to it. Next up, let's take a look at threat-based decks. Now, these are going to be secrecy decks, which involves keeping your threat very low, and then we're going to look at some other kinds. Secrecy was a very early on archetype and involved playing cards at a discount if your threat was below 20. So people would generally t try to take less heroes. Um, eventually we, we got Strider, which allowed you to, to kind of like, when you're down a hero, you're down a resource, you're down a character that can fight, defend, and quest. And so this card kind of helps you to get a double duty out of some of your characters. Um, adding cards like Resourceful allows you to get better, you know, more resources and make up for those, um, uh, those lackings as well. Cards like Tom and the Aid, 
can bring out really, really powerful allies for a very low price for one resource. And then other cards that just give you a blanket um, discount by playing them. Unfortunately, this archetype is not, wasn't very strong. However, in recent years, we've gotten bonuses to play it in the contracts, like the Grey Wanderer, which allows you to start with a single hero and allows you to really make an effective secrecy deck. Other cards like Aragorn um, are a very good combo in order to lower your threat. And he's, he's used actually in a variety of the threat-based decks, whether they're going to be some of the ones that we're going to go into in a moment, or these uh, these kind of decks where you'll want to reset so that you can stay back, and come, you know, go back into secrecy. Next up, continuing the uh, threat type of deck, we're going to look at Doomed. Doomed are some powerful effects that you could play, but they came at the cost of having Doomed on the card, which means you have to raise your threat, which is one of your resources. Um, so... But it's not just you, you have to raise everybody's threat at the table. Now, these kind of cards were, you know, kind of a weaker uh, archetype because everybody has to raise their, their threat. However, they did have some very powerful cards within there. Now, let's take a look here at some of them. The, there wasn't a lot in this. Um, there's a few more than this, but, you know, you can see that you get some other benefits. Grima Wurringtongue, very interesting hero. You could give cards doomed to play more cards quickly. Much better in solo little punishing in multiplayer, although wonderfully thematic. And then using keys between Keys of Orthanc and Grima to gain a lot of uh, resource advantage. Most of the cards in the Doom mechanism are cards that just end up getting sprinkled in, like everybody gets the benefit of Doom 2 and drawing two cards, everybody gets the benefit of Doom 4, adding a resource to their hero pool. Those cards end up just being splashed and the Doom archetype kind of fell away. However, that was until Saruman came out. And Saruman kind of changed the Doom archetype quite a bit. Uh, he allowed you to have Saruman's staff, which would reduce the Doomed cost, and it would ready him. So he kind of put a whole new spin on it, and so now most of the Doom decks that are around really just revolve around Saruman. Next up, we're not going to be too hasty. We've got to take things nice and slow, because we've got the Ents. The Ents are very, very thematic, big fan thematic win. Um, they are... They come in to play exhausted, they're very inexpensive, and then they ready. So they're very slow faction, you're just playing and playing ends, but you can't get to use them right away. But once they get, you get a big playing board of full of them, then they get very angry and they get very good. And you can see um, they deal a lot on damaging themselves. You can grab them up into your hand, cards like Booming Ent and Leaf Lock. Uh, they get benefits for having lots of damaged other damaged Ents, and there's a lot of Ents that can damage themselves to do other effects as well. Treebeard as an ally, um, there is a hero, but he doesn't really fit in with this archetype at all. Uh, but Well, he does a little bit, but the ally Treebeard, one of the best allies in the game, uh, he can use his resources that he'll gain as, a, as an ally, which is not a very common thing in the game, to pay for other end cards and to ready himself. Um, the end archetype is a middle of the road archetype. Uh, again, like many of these archetypes, if you're while you're building, the game could uh, could crush you. But if you can get past that turning point and get a nice board built up, uh, so it's a bit of a, a, a middle ground type of um, archetype. If you're paired with another deck that can move a little quicker and can uh, hold things off while you're building, that can be a good way to go. Next up, we have Kaldara, very very powerful hero, very interesting ability. She did get nerfed. She used to be definitely top tier, one of the best decks you could play, one of the most powerful decks for sure. Um, however, she got nerfed. You can, um, she has an ability that you could use over and over and over again. Now she only has the ability that you can use once a, turn, once a game. I still think it's a very powerful deck, although not maybe not the top, top tier. Essentially, the deck involves um, discarding Kaldara to put a, a spirit ally into, from your discard pile into play for each of your spirit heroes. So essentially, you would be able to you know, discard her, have ways to throw your hero, uh, very chunky, good allies into the discard and then bring them out. And then using cards like Prince Immerhill, who becomes a hero when there's another hero in your discard in order to replace her and to give you that tempo. Uh, so you're te you get a really good tempo, you know, boost by playing her. And then cards like, uh, you know, like Emery and et cetera, that will put other cards in there. There's other heroes. Uh, generally, you see uh, heroes like Kirdan and um, Arwen with her uh, as one of the strongest lineups. But that's a way to get some very powerful spirit allies. Maybe the most pa powerful spirit deck ever made in uh, when she was unnerfed. But it is still a super fun uh, deck to play. Very fun decisions and things. Um, maybe not the most thematic deck, I think, but also uh, quite fun and I think quite powerful Next up, we have Voltron Heroes. And this applies to a lot of decks. Um, you can have Voltron Heroes in any kind of deck, but essentially the idea is putting a lot of attachments on one or more heroes. And that just bring, makes them more and more powerful. And usually involves characters that can self-ready, 
or characters um, that you're putting unexpected courage and other cards on them to ready them. Aragorn is a very popular choice for this kind of a deck as he can ready himself uh, and, uh, and you know, he has a lot of toys, a lot of cards. Um, this is just an example of some that give a benefit, but also a special benefit if it's Aragorn, and sometimes only benefits if it's Aragorn. Other characters like Grimborn the Old, things like that, that can basically, you can Voltron him up, and he can single-handedly handle combat. I talked about Boromir before. Um, it's a very uh, uh, interesting deck to play. Now, a lot of the heroes in the game are specialized at defending, attacking, or questing. And so, be picking a character that has rounded stats or that has benefits in multiple things, those generally tend to be behoove you to um, to build them up and to put unexpected courage or something. But other times you might want to pick a character like uh, that has a very high attack or range or something that can be kind of the dedicated attacker of the table and put a bunch of unexpected courages, a bunch of bows and weapons and things like that on them. And now we're going to look at the Harad. There's a very few cards in this um, archetype. It's more of a sub archetype, but it is prevalent. And that this archetype revolves around uh, Khalil. And there are three very, very powerful uh, allies in the Harad um, faction. And these are, uh, these two, uh, Jubair and uh, Firial are two of the most powerful allies in the game period. In fact, I talked about Kaldar a minute ago. Jubair is the kind of card that you would throw in your discard to try to get pretty early on. Um, he can uh, ready them, and there are some other cards to make them inex more inexpensive to play, and also to recycle them into, you know, um, it's essentially you want to charge up these handful of very powerful allies and then uh, and then be able to use them uh, multiple times in a round. However, uh, these allies are almost much better splashed in other decks. This kind of an archetype, um, it's I would say medium strength. A lot of times in this game just using something like dwarves where you're just getting you know quantity over quality uh, can really make a difference. There's a lot of like universally um, boosting effects and so ten it tends to be better to have a lot of characters rather than um, you know that are medium strength or weaker rather than a few very powerful characters although that's not always true. Next up we're going to look at Gondor. So Gondor is usually ensconced in the leadership sphere and both Gondor and leadership are um, often times tied to getting a lot of resources, a lot of cash. So that's one way um, that Gondor goes, and that involves like, like cards like uh, Boromir, Leadership Boromir, who gets uh, you know extra fight for his allies if he has resources, uh, Visionary Leadership you attach, and you can get, um, you know, if you have resources, you can get more willpower. Denethor starts with more resources, um, and then you have cards that can move around resources or gain your resources. Um, later on in the life of the game, they had Lothiriel come out, and they started a bit of a other sort of thing going on where you um, you have cards that you can put into play that will have put into play effects, kind of like the Sylvan a little bit, which allows you to bring things back from your graveyard um, or uh, or start, search your deck for different cards. Um, Lothiriel was kind of a like a, a breath of fresh air for a lot of cards that weren't being used anymore. However, she's not a very strong archetype because she ends up burning cards out of your hand and getting them shuffled in your deck and that doesn't tend to be very strong. And unfortunately, because of that, it's not the Gondor. Either way you can play Gondor isn't a very strong archetype. I think it's about middle ground. Lothiriel's a little weaker, unfortunately. Um, I'm gonna talk about Rohan in a bit, and it kind of has the same kind of a thing where you're losing cards and you really wanna be playing cards onto the table. I'll talk a little bit more um, about Gondor because there is another thing called Valor, which is, which is its own archetype, but it is tied a bit into a lot of the Gondor cards. Well, no time like the present. Let's go right into Valor. Valor are basically cards kind of the opposite of secrecy. Once your threat hits 40, these cards will provide you with powerful effects. So it's a bit risky because being above 40, you know, you're very close to threading out, but you're getting these very, very powerful effects. Um, cards that can set you right there or reduce your threat or other effects like they have actions and then they have a Valor action that's more powerful. Um, there aren't a, there isn't a huge amount of support for this archetype, but it is there and it's of a lesser degree. It's a less less powerful type of, uh, because it's so risky and also the effects generally aren't powerful enough to really warrant playing that way. Next up we have the Noldor. Now I mentioned before that the elves in the Lord of the Ring card game are separated into Noldor or Sylvan. The Noldor is one of the most powerful factions in the game, definitely top tier. And it involves discarding a lot of cards from your hand for different effects. Instead of paying just resources, you're paying cards as well. But cards in your discard can be regotten, and cards in the discard um, can also power up and do different things. Most Noldor decks include Arwen and Círdan, and generally uh, 
uh, also a um, excuse me a lore hero like Galdor, although that's not always the case. Um, Kirdan and uh, Arwen mill through your deck pretty good, putting cards like Lords of the Eldar in there. Uh, Elven Light can be pulled out to draw additional cards. Glorfindel in a thematic win can be played from your discard. And then you can play use to the sea to the sea to toss out cards to put in heavy hitting allies like the Twins. Throw cards away to put, put Elven Jeweler into play and then just like things like Elven Light and then just get them back and keep recycling. Um, Arwen is one of the most powerful heroes in the game and if you put there's an attachment that will allow Kirdan not to exhaust during questing so it can use Naria. Naria can ready up the more powerful allies you have like Glorfindel or Elrohir here um, or Eladan to, for repeated use. Uh, the as I say, it's a top tier. It's also a very fun, and there's a lot of the most um, memorable and exciting characters from the Lord of the Rings in the Noldor faction. So um, there are some other archetypes in there, some lesser ones, um, and there are other like tactics and leadership. But mainly, this is uh, where most of the support is in leadership, or excuse me, in uh, spirit and lore. Scouts is another small fa small sub archetype. It's weird because there are is some support for it. There's a lot of events and things, and there's some incentives to do so uh, in events and things. But um, it's not a huge faction. It's not very powerful, and it's really there's only like one or two dedicated decks you really could even make for the faction. However, a lot of those cards are tied into the uh, location control. Now, locations are one of the major parts of the game. It's one third of the game is locations. And that kind of falls into two major categories. Number one is using, um, you know, putting attachments on locations that are uh, the active location. And the other one is to um, add progress to locations in the staging area. Um, very popular cards like Northern Tracker over the you know course of the game can eliminate basically everything in the staging area. And then other attachments like these um, can help you to get rid of enemies, move through locations faster, bring in allies. Uh, Haldan um, is one of the characters that this archetype revolves around that you can use, although you don't have to play him. There's a lot of location to control. Um, oftentimes you might have one player. If you have like three, if you get three or four players, generally it's probably a good idea to have somebody that's really committed to either questing very strongly or trying to clean up a lot of those locations. There is no really like healer class in Lord of the Rings. There's healing cards, but um, it kind of makes me think of that like where people are always looking for like a, a healer or a cleric or a medic in a lot of like video games and things. I think somebody, you know, that's a, a type of person that everybody's always thankful to see at the table, but not a lot of people end up playing. Next up, we have Dale. Now, Dale involves um, ha playing lots of allies and equipping them with, with cheap attachments. Now, normally, this is very dangerous to equip and uh, get a lot of attachments and spend a lot of cards and resources on attachments for your allies if they go away. But this kind of a deck is made between two heroes. Generally, it involves Bard, Son of Brand, and Brand, Son of Bane. Uh, one of them gives bonuses uh, to your uh, to all the people that have um, a weapon or any kind of attachment, and uh, and Bard allows you to pay for attachments of any sphere, and also if, if an ally leaves play, you can pull those attachments back to your hand so you can play them again. Also, Bard, when you play an attachment on an ally, allows you to draw another card. So there's lots of allies that gets be get benefits from having different attachments. There's cards that move attachments around. Um, the King of Dale allows you to put in really cheap allies and not really worry about the spheres. This deck is top tier. It Most of the deck you can buy um, called Wilds of Rovania, and you can almost get the entire deck in there. Find a few other cards, and you've got one of the most powerful decks you can play in the game. It's also very, very fun to be equipping different allies. There's lots of choices to be made. Sometimes you play, attach an ally to somebody just to draw a card, and then later on you can move it to where you want it to be more. A lot of smart plays. Um, not really that advanced, although maybe more advanced if somebody's not used to this kind of game. But a super fun deck to play, and very, very powerful. Uh, a little bit of an archetype, uh, sub-archetype in there as well. Guardian Eskaroth, so instead of having a whole field full of different allies that are all kind of equipped up, um, you can give these guys a lot of attachments and then play a card on them that will allow them to um, not exhaust a quest, so they'll be like adding, like either attacking and questing for a lot or defending and questing for a lot, and so that's another like mini archetype there. Another little sub-archetype is that of the Bjornings. Um, you do have a couple of Bjorning heroes, you've got Bjorn and Grimbjorn the Old, but um, there are just a small smattering of cards otherwise. Uh, you've got ally cards for Bjorn and some of the uh, beekeepers and etc. Um, the really cool little part of this is the Bjorning Skin Changer, who you can 
grab a giant bear out from the discard, which is pretty fun. Um, this isn't really enough to support a whole deck. It's more like something you might try different cards or have like a smaller part of a deck and not very powerful. Most of the Bjornings aren't very powerful except for the Skin Changer who is actually kind of fun and can be quite kind of powerful, but usually he's more of a splash in a different kind of a deck. Then there's Leadership Questing. Now this is a very powerful um, archetype. Leadership is very, very wealthy, as I said before, and it involves a lot of the best global ways to, to pump up your willpower. Cards like Faramir and uh, the Sword that was broken on Aragorn can like rack up a ton of willpower and really let you blast through quests. Um, also very good tail. This is used in this deck a lot and also it's kind of an archetype on its own. It's a way to really get very, very powerful allies in very fast. Um, and those can kind of work together to create like a, a sort of a leadership swarm type of deck. And there's a lot of options in, 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 uh, in there as well. Um, I mentioned before about Gondor being a little weaker, but you could make a deck with Aragorn and uh, Faramir and Sword That Was Broken and kind of be able to go in that direction uh, and make a more powerful Gondor style of deck. Next up, we've got uh, Radagast, who is a little bit of an archetype unto himself. He generally uses the creatures. There's not a lot of creature um, allies in this game, but he ties in with them. Generally, uh, Radagast will play a creature using his staff to, for, for less or to be able to ready them uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, and then he'll be able to quest for free and then defend and there's some other neat creatures and things in here that work with him quite well as he can play any of those um, different uh, spheres. But one of his favorite things to play are eagles, which is the next archetype we're going to talk about. Now eagles are an earl earlier faction of the game that came out and essentially most of the cards, they go away. Eagles come and then they go. They're kind of unreliable in the, um, you know, you can't really depend on them to be there all the time. And it's very kind of a thematic win. Essentially what the deck is, is you play these cheap allies like Winged Guardian, Vassal, Windlord, uh, use Gregor's Dead, things like that, to uh, bring these kind of eagles in. Then when they, you can't pay for them or you want, or you just let them go away, they will be slipped under Eagles of the Misty Mountain, which just makes them stronger and stronger and stronger. Then you put support of the eagles on one of your heroes, uh, one of your tactics heroes, and then you can boost their attack or defense. And that's like a very powerful thing to do. So you'll begin the game with these small eagles, and then you'll end the game with a very large couple of eagles of the Misty Mountains, along with support of the eagles to juice up some of your heroes. Um, Gwai here did come out, which changed up the archetype a little bit, allowing you to play, you know, getting other benefits from Gwai here, you know, being able to attack and defend with him multiple times around, as well as being able to draw a lot of cards where the eagles are coming. Um, the eagles deck... I would say his middle ground strength, um, it was kind of very strong early on, uh, later on in the game's life cycle. It's pretty middle ground, but it's a fun deck to play, although a little uh, a little bit one note, I think. It's kind of, you play very similar each time. Uh, Eagles tend to be, you know, sprinkled throughout other things, although Radagast did, is an interesting way to play as well. It allows you to, like, ready up the Eagles of the Misty Mountain with your staff. Um, although, yeah, like I say, still uh, thematically cool, but still probably middle of the road in strength. Next up, we're going to talk about Gandalf. He's an archetype unto himself. I mean, he's a very, very powerful hero. He's very, very fun. And he plays uh, with the top card of his deck, Reveal. Now, he it's because in the books and in the movies, he always seems to know something other people don't. Uh, that's especially so in the movie, in the, excuse me, in the books. I really love that little thematic nod. I did, didn't mention before about Saruman, who uses Doomed. Uh, because he, and I love this little thematic thing, is that because he desires power no matter the cost. So he ratches his threat up for that extra power. And I think that's a very thematic win for that. Gandalf has a lot of toys, uh, which allow him to, you know, he has Shadowfax, uh, Bilbo to get his pipe. His pipe can switch cards. Um, and he has his staff, which is one of the most powerful cards in the game. It's very versatile, which is one of his major strengths. He has very, very powerful stats. Uh, and with these toys and a bunch of other things, he can be very strong. Another way to play him is to, um, and this is sometimes in secrecy decks, is to use his ally. Uh, he has two different allies, one that can stick around. He, if you play him uh, in the early game and you let your threat rank up, uh, rack up, but he has very powerful stats. You can also attach his toys to him as well. And he's generally used sometimes uh, in secrecy decks when you get set up and then you don't care about your threat anymore and you just play uh, Overhill, Underhill, Gandalf, as he's called, to, you know, to be a very powerful ally that can do multiple things in a round. Another sub archetype is weapon decks. Now weapons are generally things that you attach to different characters, either characters or heroes, and they buff their um, attack, defense, or whatever. Um, there is a small kind of archetype in the game where you can exhaust weapons to do certain things and Bofor can find them for you. Although this is, like I say, a very slight um, uh, archetype and most of the time they're just kind of splashed in and sprinkled into different decks, although you can do that. And sometimes these tie in a little bit with the um, direct damage decks. Next up uh, are side quest decks. 
Now, side quests are very powerful, interesting, um, you know, risk reward type things where you can spend time questing on them to get powerful effects, but then you're not doing what you need to do in the regular, um, the regular questing and things. However, there's a lot of support for them. Again, they are sprinkled through, um, you know, they can be splashed quite easily because they have these very powerful effects, but there is a, um, a dedicated style of deck using side quests. Usually this involves Thurindir, who gets um, more and more, uh, stronger and stronger the more side quests get in the victory display. Uh, Thalion is, is um, uh, this is one of the major designers of the game here, his artwork here. Uh, he will become a hero if you can get enough side quests in the victory display. And there are other cards that allow you to like, cancel effects, go grab more side quests, or have very powerful weapons that get juiced up. It's actually a very fun little, um, little archetype. Again, it's one of those where like, if you can build up and get to that point, you can do very, very well. But in the early games, you can get crushed. So I would say it's a middle, of the, uh, middle road uh, in its strength. Next up, another little sub archetype, and that's mounts. Um, of course, horses are very important in Lord of the Rings, in the lore, in the movies, etc. Um, and there's a small amount of support for it. There's a lot of horses um, for different characters. This is some examples of some. Uh, an elf helm uh, is a very interesting archetype that you can, you know, ratchet up uh, different stats if, if heroes have different mounts. And there's, of course, cards that can fetch the mounts for you and things. Um, Elf Helm is not one of the more powerful heroes. You don't see this very often. Um, anybody making a dedicated mount deck. Normally, they're just useful uh, to attach to the specific heroes that they're helpful for, but you can make a de dedicated deck, although it would be on the weaker side or a little more of a component to a different style deck. Next up, we have attacking into the staging area. Now, early in the game, Rohan was kind of, that was their thing, and the idea was that um, thematically, you were riding your horse in and attacking the enemy in the staging area and coming back, so you didn't have to defend against these um, attacks, but you're able to, you know, you can attack the enemies without having to defend them, which helps for your action economy. There aren't a ton of cards for this, but that does exist. Uh, Junhir and Aomir are two of the, the, the major heroes that are in that archetype. There's another uh, Rohan hero that will bounce them back to the um, staging area. I forgot to grab him out. Uh, cards like Spear of the Mark give you benefits for that. And then there's other cards like the Great U Bow and uh, Anborn and some others that allow you to damage uh, enemies in the staging area as well. And that kind of ties a little bit in with some of the direct damage decks. Um, it's a middle, a middle ground type of thing. You have to keep your threat low enough for the enemies not to come down. Some you know you don't want to have to defend them all the time so um it can be a bit of a um a bit of a struggle sometimes if enemies get multiple attacks during shadow effects if you're trying to bounce them back to the staging area then you uh then you have to deal with that extra attack which you don't always really want to so i would say it's a middle of the road archetype um and there are but there are some weird um janky kind of things if it's the, you know it appeals to the players that like to build oddball decks i think especially when you're talking about the great U bow um as that's not very powerful uh but there are some established decks in the are they are with the other aomir and done here Next up, we have a fairly old um, archetype, which is traps. Been around a very long time. They're all almost all rooted in um, lore. There are a couple of uh, tactics traps that are quite good, but essentially, this you will uh, add on. You know, put these traps into the staging area. Um, the downside is that you don't know what's going to come out if the you know if an enemy comes out and it's not the one that you wanted to trap. Oh, so be it. But it's very thematic. Uh, either poison stakes, they can damage enemies over time. Ranger spikes leaves them in the staging area. Um, there's heroes and things that can recur them. There's a hero that gets uh, that uh, Damrod who can draw cards when things go into traps. There's other traps that can trap people that are engaged with you. You want to keep them from uh, uh, you know making engagement checks, and there's benefits for attacking them and stuff. The traps are kind of a, a weaker uh, deck archetype in there. Um, you can certainly some scenarios are very, they can be very useful, and you can make a very you could make a powerful deck out of it. Generally, a lot of times um, traps are linked with uh, the um, Dunedain because the Dunedain like to have enemies engage with them. So sometimes you might use uh, do kind of a split with Dun half Dunedain half traps, so you can keep those enemies engaged with you, but they can't really attack you because there's forest snared or they're trapped in some way. Um, and followed is another one that you can use, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting little archetype, an older one. It's fun, um, but again, not super powerful. Then there's the guarded ar uh, archetype, a little bit of a sub archetype. Essentially, there's a lot of very, very powerful um, artifacts and items in Middle Earth, and these are represented by guarded uh, cards. Essentially, these cards um, give you insanely good bonuses, but when they come out, they're guarded by some kind of card, which could be a very strong enemy, could be um, you know a location depending on what that is, and you have to either kill the enemy or clear the location in order to get the card. 
Now this archetype, these cards are very, very powerful, really, really good cards, and you always want them. However, a lot of times playing a, uh, a guarded card can bring an enemy or a location or something out that can just end your game. So people tend to be very careful when like putting these into the deck. Uh, it can, it's a very risky way to play and often can r ruin the game for everyone, which is unfortunate. Um, but having one or two at the right time can uh, you know, really power up your heroes. There is a card, a contract, the Burglar's Turn, which allows you to put these cards um, randomly into play and not have them be guarded. It is a contract that has a bunch of drawbacks, but it's one of the more uh, uh, economical ways of getting um, guarded cards out, although it's not a very powerful uh, archetype that to play, and it has, uh, like I say, some drawbacks to it, but it can be fun and very thematic if you play it with like dwarves uh, and Bilbo. Probably wondering when we were going to get around to Hobbits. Let's talk about Hobbits now. Now, Hobbits have a few different archetypes. In the beginning of the game, they really dealt with um, getting threat, taking threat, and then getting some benefit from it. But then they, they switched to always doing better when you have less threat. So looking at cards like this, uh, Frodo, very early card, Fatty Bulger, um, they all will increase your threat, but you're gaining some kind of benefit. Frodo is still a very powerful card, um, but this archetype had some support and then they kind of changed their mind um, midstream and they stopped kind of supporting this. It's uh, some of the, Pippin, one of the worst heroes in the game for spirit. Um, he kind of goes along with this archetype and generally not a very strong archetype. But then along came the Black Riders expansion and uh, you got a whole new way to play Hobbits, which was to keep your threat low and get some benefits. Um, heroes like Sam Gamgee, one of the best heroes in the game, uh, getting benefits and readying up when your threat is low. Uh, Pippin keeping the enemy's threats high, uh, and then Mary being able to knock them out quite easily, um, using cards like Habako, Dagger, Western S, very powerful cards if your threat is low. Um, so it's a very interesting archetype to play. I would say it's mid, uh, middle middle of the road powerful, um, but you know you have to balance that and you have to keep your threat low. As the game continues, your threat is continually going up, and if you can't keep it low enough, um, you're going to lose a lot of those benefits, and so it's a little bit tricky. But still super fun to play, um, one of the most, I would say one of the most popular deck styles to play. Towards the end of the game, they did come up with another Hobbit type archetype, which revolved around Tom Cotton. Um, and this was much more of a way to bounce um, Hobbits in and out, to play sort of like the Sylvans, where they would all have kind of effects when they came in, um, and then you could, you know, keep recurring them. Um, unfortunately, this archetype never really gained a lot of traction. It wasn't strong enough. It's very uh, much on the, more on the weaker side. It does represent um, the part of the story of the Scouring of the Shire. Uh, and, and it's kind of fun and it has some interesting things about it, but unfortunately just doesn't pack enough punch. Now along last we're going to talk about Rohan. Obviously Rohan, one of the two major factions in the Lord of the Rings, um, and, one, and oftentimes people's favorite. Uh, Rohan, most of their mechanisms revolve around discarding, you know, um, their soldiers and, uh, and troops for benefits. Uh, this is much like, you know, death, 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 ride to ruin, you know, and this whole concept of like, you know, being, you know, going into sort of Valhalla, their, their version of Valhalla. Um, a lot of their cards revolve around recurring um, allies like that, getting a benefit, but then having to discard, uh, you know, discarding them for that. And then cards like Guthwini to bring them back. Um, when they come into play, they can do some effect, uh, getting juiced up like Aromare here, Aromare here, who gets uh, stronger and then uh, different characters to play them. Unfortunately, this is a very weak faction because it's better to build your board up and keep playing allies and getting stronger and stronger um, when you're sacrificing your cards all the time. You're not really gaining in strength. And unfortunately, this faction never really got that strong. So playing like a Rohan specific, like playing all the army, different allies and stuff, not very strong. However, the Rohan heroes themselves um, are some of the best heroes in the game, like Aowen, both versions of Aowen, very strong. Um, you know, there's different different Rohan heroes, like Arkenbrand, very good. There's a lot of heroes um, that end up finding their way into different decks. Um, just that specific, like, more tribal Rohan deck, not very strong. One of the weaker factions in the game. Now we're going to talk about Messenger of the King. This isn't really a, uh, an archetype unto, unto of itself, but there are a lot of decks that people would build which would use a card called Sword Thing. And this was a way to turn an ally, a unique ally, into a hero because they had some kind of deck that they wanted to build, somebody wanted to build. And essentially, Messenger of the King allows you to start with a unique, um, uh, unique 
ally as a hero. Um, and generally this is good for uh, secrecy decks as they, they're very low threat, you know, most of the time, but also it allows you to start with some kind of weird janky combo. So someone like Rosie Cotton that a lot of people will build decks around instead of having a sword thane her, um, you could just start with her. So Messenger of the King um, really opened a lot of doors up for many, many different decks. Now we're going to talk about individual heroes that are sort of archetypes in and of themselves. First up, we have Hama. He has the ability to recur events, so a lot of interesting decks can be built around him. They did nerf him a little bit and make it so you can only use his ability three times a game, although you can still do some very interesting things with him. Uh, Prince Imrahil, the tactics version of him, allows you to pull different cards out of the deck um, uh, you know, during the combat phase, adding um, the uh, Elf Friend card or... Yeah, I believe Elf Friend is the name of the card. Gives him the Elven trait and actually makes him a very good Sylvan hero, which is a little thematic misfire. But um, he has a kind of a whole archetype around himself. Not that popular. Uh, you know, again, these are all... Um, it's hard to measure their, their strength in terms of their... You know, whether they're top tier or not because they're single heroes. Uh, Haldir has a whole kind of deck around himself where he can kind of snipe things out of, this, out of the staging area. Much uh, very similar to the, um, the style that Rohan has with Dune here. Um, Glowin is a whole thing all about himself as well, where he takes damage to get resources. And there are these really wild and crazy decks where you give him tons and tons of health and just have him get damaged like crazy. Uh, and, and he can pay for a lot of different cars or use Blood of Numenor and, um, and Gondorian Fire to just do massive damage. If you really like janky, strange combos, uh, he's a great one. And then maybe one of the most interesting, if not the most interesting hero in the game is Aristor. There's all kinds of crazy decks around him where he draws tons of cards, but he has to discard them all at the end of the turn. So you can do a lot of interesting decks with him. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the strongest Gondor decks use him because that's one of their big weaknesses. So if you don't mind being a little unthematic by putting Aristor in a Gondor deck, you can make some actually some pretty strong Gondor swarm decks with him. But Aristor requires specific, very interesting builds to play. Next up, we have Elrond, maybe one of the strongest, if not the strongest hero in the game, when he's combined with his Ring of Power, Vilya. Um, he's able to put in at the top card of your deck. If you know what the top card is, or you build pr correctly, or if you're using like Gandalf or something, or, Immo or the Stargazer to, to stack your deck, this is an amazing uh, combo because you can basically make some of the most powerful decks in the whole game because he can essentially just put in, you can take all the best allies in the game, stick them in a deck, and then he can just every round just keep churning out these allies. Now it makes sense because Elrond in the books, he has his house and that's, and, and that's kind of like where he gathers uh, his, uh, you know, different allies and things. Um, he can also pay for allies as an extra thing, like he needs it. Uh, and he also is a very good healer, which of course he is in the books. Um, and so he gets a benefit there as well. So um, all in all, he's one of the, one of the top three heroes in the game. Also, Glorfindel um, used to be one of the major he top, top heroes. Um, I think he still is very splashable. Uh, he only has five threats, so you can put him in a lot of different decks um, for a lot of really great benefits um, uh, in order to keep your threat low. Um, he also has Light of Valinor and Asphaloth that he can use in order to uh, quest and attack, which is very, very strong and powerful. Um, he does have a little bit of a downside, but if you can get Light of Valinor, it kind of cancels out his downside. So he's often used in secrecy decks or really any kind of deck that you want to keep your threat low because he's a very, very powerful hero for his threat cost. I'm going to wrap up with a few of the other contracts that, um, you know, they're archetypes in and of themselves. Uh, so let's take a look. There's the Bond of Friendship, which allows you to play with four heroes, although there are some restrictions there. Kind of interesting, not super powerful. Council of the Wise, you play with one copy of each card in your deck um, for events and things. This is a really weird, uh, weird oddball kind of way to play. Um, unfortunately, you can't play very consistently because you don't know what's going to be in your deck, but it is kind of fun and interesting. And if you're really kind of bored with playing Lord of the Rings uh, the same old way, it's kind of an interesting, really unique way to play. Uh, and then the Fellowship of the Ring is a, um, you generally want to play with very strong uh, allies. When you get to nine, you flip this over and they all get plus one to their stats. So you generally want to take very powerful heroes like Overhill Under Kill Gandalf, who, um, you know, doesn't exhaust a quest, or Treebeard, who can ready himself or any kind of character that's going to be um, uh, ready. Now, this is the kind of contract you want to play a lot of cards really quickly, um, but you can make a variety of different decks with heroes, uh, excuse me, allies that you really enjoy playing. Um, it's a fun way to play, a thematic way to play, and I would say middle of the, middle of the road power. Um, you know, there are some builds out there that you can really get some very powerful things out. 
you know, but it's a little bit of a fragile contract. Okay, so there you have it. That's all of, I think, all the major archetypes that uh, are, exist in Lord of the Rings. I might have missed um, one or two small factions or something, but that's a really good jumping off point for you to understand different things that you can do in the game. I hope that you enjoyed this uh, video. Comment below if there's um, anything that you were excited about to try. Again, um, <clears throat> you know, you can use this as a jumping off point to build your own decks, or you go on RingsDB and look up some of these cards and find some other decks that uh, there's thousands on there other people have built. But for now, I gotta roll.